Okay, hello everybody. I'm Holly Hughes and I'm honored to be the MC for the final set. So welcome to the closing set for Fisher Poets Gathering 2021, the Zoom edition. As Jay said, we've had to go virtual this year, but we're hoping to be personal next year. Under normal circumstances, Fisher Poets attracts nearly 100 poets, songwriters, and storytellers from both coasts, including Alaska and Hawaii, and, and often as far away as England. In fact, we have a performer from England tonight, thanks to Zoom. A celebration of the commercial fish, fishing industry in poetry, prose, and song, the Fisher Poets Gathering has been happening the last weekend in February since 1998. I've been lucky enough to be a participant every year since that first year when a handful of us gathered at the Wet Dog. Since then, it's grown by leaps and bounds, and it's a testament to the commitment and resiliency of the Fisher Poet crew that this is happening this year especially. So some people to thank, thanks to the efforts of, of John Broderick, Jay Speakerman, and all those behind the screens. Amanda and her Able Sea Grant crew. Thank you also to my trusty backup MC, Doug Rhodes, who will be performing tonight and has been right there supporting me and the performers all along. I'd also like to thank some of our sponsors. Um, we've got a great lineup. Actually, the sponsors. Here we go. Sponsors are Oregon Sea Grant, the Tillicum Foundation, KMUN, City of Astoria, Hip Fish Monthly, um, Jonathan White, Michelle Abramson, Patricia Freeland, Clatsop Community College, Oregon Folklife Network, Astoria Warrington Cham Chamber of Commerce. And um, I'll maybe mention a few more later on. I also wanted just to just acknowledge that normally we're filling these wonderful venues in Astoria and instead we're filling a Zoom screen, which is exciting, but not quite the same. So just a quick shout out to the um, venues that we can't be at this year, but we hope to be back next year. The Astoria Brewing Company, which was formerly the Wet Dog, where, where this whole thing started. The Kala Gallery, the Columbia Theater, the Liberty Theater, the Fort George Lovell Showroom, the Voodoo Room, one of my favorites, the 1015 Theater, the Labor Temple Diner and Bar, Winecraft, Clatsop Community College, Pier 39, and the Cannery Workers Museum, and finally, the Columbia River Maritime Museum. So, um, so let's go ahead and, and get started then. Um, the way this is going to work is I'll call out the name of each performer and where they're from, and then they'll take it from there, telling you a little bit of about their background in fishing and whatever they want to tell you about whatever they're planning to share. Leading us off is Henry Hughes from Monmouth, Oregon, no relation. Um, I do happen to know he's a fine poet. So Henry, let's, let's get started. Take it away. Thanks so much, Holly. It's great to be here. I'm really honored to be with so many fine uh, poets, musicians, and artists. I grew up uh, in Long Island, New York, uh, on Long Island Sound. And uh, in those days, I, I was a deckhand on mostly on charter fishing boats, but I'd pitch in on a dragger or a lobster boat. And so this poem is set back in the 80s when I had just finished high school and I was pitching in with a kind of a tough a lobsterman. And uh, this is lobstering. Long Island, 1983. And don't show up drunk, Ziggy warned, but I had one hell of a hangover, waking in my parked car to the window thump of his greasy fist. I was 18. We baited a hundred wooden pots, stacked the deck, and ran that dirty down easter toward Shoreham, the nuclear plant they never finished. When my dad worked for 10 years, Goddamn waste, Ziggy shook his head, and we're gonna pay for it. He smoked down cigarettes. I splashed heavy pots. Every time he yelled, drop it friggin' flat, I thought of my girlfriend and getting paid. We'd pick him up in a couple days, no numbers, all in his head, black and white bullet buoys, lying on a davit, seaweed, plastic, spider crabs, snails, 
and marble brown lobsters pulled from the bedroom. Girls and kids, back over. Rubber bands on the claws of a keeper, some rich guy from Manhattan will buy at the restaurant, wearing his ridiculous bib, cracking a fat claw that squirts his girlfriend's face. Their drunken laughter, sounding like gulls, swooping the last of the rotten fish I cleaned from those pots. I've got one more poem. Uh, a lot of a lot of us fisher people talk about superstition. You know, of course, historically it was very important to people who sailed and fished. But I, I think luck still plays into it. We still talk about luck. So this comes out of an experience with an artisanal fishery uh, for bluefin tuna, rod and reel fishery for bluefin off of Maine. And a friend uh, had a good season down there. He's he was basically a deck hand. And the last day. He asked the captain, a very superstitious old guy, if he could bring his girlfriend along. And the captain hesitated a little bit, but then he said, okay, this is luck. Cappy tore apart the shack, searching for his favorite salt-stained tattered hat, barking at us when we stepped over rods or taunted a gull. We'd never pack a banana or rename a boat, even if the boat's name was Misty. Old time was warned of redheads, women, and whistling. And she was all three, boarding left-footed in her green bibs and starfish sweater, conjuring gentle swells and the season's biggest bluefin. She fought that fish for three hours till we gaffed, hook flying free, and hoisted. Her arms and back relaxed. Her glowing hair fell to dusk. You're a lucky gal, Cappy praised best he could. Watching that huge tuna beat out its last song, she looked wistful and blue, like a mermaid farewelling a friend. Thanks so much. Rock on, poets. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henry. That was that was wonderful. Wow. That second one especially brought back memories for me of watching. It's always hard, um, you know, watching a, a fish die. And um, I also remember the very first time I, my first season in Petersburg, it, you know, stepping onto a boat and having a skipper shout at me that get off, get off your bad luck. So I know those superstitions die hard, but I hope that we're making some, some, a few changes since now there's lots more women in the fleet, which is good to see. Um, thank you. And thank you for the, the little taste of lobstering and, and little, I love learning about fishing on the other coast too. Okay, next up, we have Melanie Brown from Juno. So, Melanie, can you say a few words about yourself? And we'd love to hear you. Sure. Hi, I'm um, talking to you here um, from Tlingit Ani, the, um, the lands of the Akwan and Takukwan uh, Tlingit people. Um, the lands of my people um, are in Bristol Bay. M my mother was born in Naknik, and that's where I have fished every summer that I fished for over 40 years now. Um, I missed a couple of years uh, because I was pregnant with my two children. And then um, this year I, I didn't go because of the pandemic. I just, there was just too much uncertainty for me. And then when the tribes and um, Crystal Bay asked that people not come in. I felt like that was uh, the deciding factor for me. Um, but I miss it terribly. Um, and I, I'm really looking forward to going back this summer, um, as long as another variant doesn't appear. Um, I'm not a greenhorn, but I still feel like one, a Fisher Poets greenhorn, that is. Um, my first Fisher Poets was a couple of years ago. And I think I would have performed last year, but um, I was in the shop, as as John said. <laughs> he said that there were a number of people in the shop last year, and, but um, I had been recovering long enough that um, I decided to make the trip so I could just enjoy being with everybody at Fisher Poets because it's just such a wonderful swirl of energy. Um, and I knew that it would really help me in my healing process. and. Um, it did. It also happened to be um, the last trip that I've taken out of state. Um, so I'm really grateful that I, I did take take the time to, to go. Um, 
Today, I'm going to share something with you that's somewhat of a freestyle, I guess. I have my thoughts all lined out, but somehow it's just really hard for me to create a flow of words um, that I could actually write down and set sort of in stone and read from. But um, hopefully what I share will make some sense. Um, I did entitle it, um, intending to try to write something. And I'm going to set a timer right now because I'm, I, I, I'm going to need a warning to not go over. Um, but the title that I came up with is Sing It Out. Um, so I remember, you know, being a girl, I've, I've, I've spent every summer of my life in Bristol Bay, um, except for, you know, the few that I mentioned. And um, my grandmother gave me my Yupik name, which means somebody who's come from far away. And that's because I had to come all the way from Sitka to, to meet my great grandparents for the first time when I was a month old. And my, um, yeah, my Yupik name is Taikupa. But I remember um, going to mug up at Nel it, when it was called Nelbro Packing Company. For you old timers who, you know, who fished Bristol Bay, you know Nelbro Packing Company. Now it's called Alaska General Seafoods. And I still fish for that camp. But I remember um, my mom, she, you know, we, we would see uh, people at Mug Up who came from up the lake. And it, it's not a derogatory term. It's just, just a description of, pe you know, people who would come down from Iliamna Lake. And, um, you know, because they had um, uh, gotten their their permits through limited entry, you know, from accumulating enough points through, you know, the gear license system. And so they would come down and um, my parents, um, when we weren't fishing yet, they liked to go to uh, Daniel O'Hara's uh, ch church, his chapel. And um, I can remember um, seeing uh, Walter Johnson, um, he'd play his bass while Danny O'Hara played his electric guitar. And I think that was the first time I ever saw live electric guitars play. But there was this man who would sing. His name was Jim Richteroff. And um, my mom explained to me today, I was, I was trying to make sure I remembered his name right, to honor him in the right way. And... Um, uh, she said he cr he crewed for Walter Johnson, but I can remember hearing on the CB radio in our little shack um, uh, the uh, uh, Walter Johnson talking to his um, I think it was his brother-in-law Gus Jensen. They came they would come down from Pedro Bay, and um, they you know I'd always hear Ambassador Hornet. Hornet ambassador, you know, their, their uh, boat names, you know, calling back and forth, talking all the time and waking us up when we needed to sleep. Um, but Jim Richteroff, when he would sing, I think it was the first time that I ever felt pierced by an amazing voice. I always loved hearing singing and trying to sing along on, you know, to the radio, to pop music. But there was something about Jim's voice that, um, was so penetrating and he had a way of singing out where like just kind of looking back and thinking about it um it's funny how you realize things when you get older thoughts will come to you that um and then and you just you understand them in a new way you know with the the time that you accumulate living um but i guess now i've come to realize that i really think jim was singing out his pain through gospel music and the people that got to witness him singing that out at the time i was just a silly girl who just like i didn't understand and i didn't understand the feelings that he was projecting just that i was feeling feelings that i didn't understand and i i wanted to laugh because I didn't know what else to do. I just felt so uneasy from these feelings. But now I feel like there's so much more understanding that I bring bring to them. Um, feelings of how much my people have been through. Um, and uh, it, uh, 
it you know this this year it's been so crazy with the pandemic and how there's such a reverberation especially with the fact that like you know the last pandemic that's really swept through um bristol bay in western alaska was a century ago it seems monumental the fact that it was a, a century ago but i think the thing that a lot of people forget is that not very many years before that there was a major catastrophe that happened, um, a natural disaster with the Katmai eruption. I've already gone over, um, but I just, I, it was hard not going. I missed the tundra. I missed the smell of the tundra. I missed the miniature forest. But staying in um, Juneau, uh, um, I, I've learned to love the forest. The forest has let me love it. And I feel like it's loved me back and it's gifted me with amazing things, with food and medicine. And um, and recently I made really Melanie. good friends with a cedar tree um, that isn't supposed to be where it is. Um, and have written, I finally become brave enough to write my own songs. And I just, um, I had planned on sharing a little sample of that, but uh, I'm sorry I've run over time Anyways, um, I'm really happy to uh, to share and be with you in this way, and I'm looking forward to being together with you again next year at Fisher Poets Gathering. Be well, take good care, and um, see you next time. Thank you so much, Melanie. Um, yeah, that was a powerful story, and we can appreciate how difficult a year it's been for everybody, and especially, I think, um, for the tribes in Alaska. So thank you for offering us that important perspective and sharing your thoughts with us too. And, and um, yes, I remember Nell Bro back in the old days in Bristol Bay. So um, thank you for re reminding me of that. And we look forward to hearing more next year, hopefully in person. Um, next up, we have Max Broderick from Cannon Beach. Um, I'll let Max introduce himself okay great yeah hi my name is max broderick um it was really uh interesting to hear melanie's perspective um i'm also a, a bristol bay fisherman fish up there for about 20 years uh with my dad john broderick he's been fishing there a lot longer than i have uh, we have a family operation up there and um i'm just gonna jump right into a poem that i wrote uh, kind of about dad john uh, and fishing. I'm going to make sure I don't run out of time here, so I'm just going to get to it. <clears throat> Johnny B's been fishing in Nishigak for 20 or more years and dragged his kids at age 13 to work and sweat and swear. At the time he enlisted me to be his crew at age 13, he'd been working two-man crews. He could use a guy like me. At first, though, I was a pansy, worthless 13-year-old boy. Unlike Johnny, I didn't understand fishing's complications and its joys. Ten hours of picking fish and I'd be tired, cold, scared, and wet, and Johnny'd just keep picking fish, all that he could get. Sometimes during a particularly cold and windy scratch, Johnny dropped me off at the cabins and then he'd head right back to picking fish and pulling gear until he could hardly stand. And it was during those times he earned the name Iron Man. Johnny enlisted me at 13, as a third man of the crew, through summer times, we fished and sweat as often fishers do. A night I remember not quite so fondly that first year of mine was one when we'd been working hard and pulling double time. I didn't really realize just what my pop had gotten me into until we were in a blow and the fish were beginning to hit our nets so hard that we couldn't get close to keeping up. And I was so exhausted that I began to throw it up. He grabbed me by my waders and said, son, you buck up. There's a blow, but there's also fish. So we are making bucks. It's why we're here. And that includes you. You're making your college tuition. You're an investment that I've made that's finally coming to fruition. See, Johnny had a reputation for fishing through thick and thin. And it was he whose motto was, we're sticking and staying. Sometimes folks would pull their nets and head in if fishing was bleak but Johnny would just keep rolling gears if fishing was on a streak. At my tender youthful age and in my naivete, I wish I could join those crews, head home and hit the hay. So sometimes he'd drop me off to a skiff heading home, me feeling a little bashful. 
and also thinking to myself, that guy's a hardworking asshole. Then sometime the next day, he'd come in and take a two-hour nap, brew some coffee, grab his gear and worn-out baseball cap, pound through the bay to his piece of mud where a buoy marked his sight, set his gear and sift the water all the way through the night. Even now, while we're fishing 20 years later, Johnny will pull a 32-hour shift, get home and pull off his waders. He'll grab his banjo and guitar and head over to Ole's for a night of music, laughter, small and tall stories. Just four years ago, we were in a bind and had to load the boat. As the tide fell quickly, we were trying to keep her afloat. Sweat dripped down my face as I rushed to load our stuff. Looking back, I saw Johnny had two anchors, chain and line, and was trudging through the mud. I'll never forget that day when we were in that pinch, and Johnny had those anchors walking through the mud inch by inch, and Johnny just kept moving, hell-bent on making his way over to the boat so we could head back out across the bay to sift water or lace our pockets. Day by day, you never can tell. But he'll be picking gear and loading nets till ice freezes over hell. Now that time's passed, he's got more than he needs for crew. But if you try to give him a break, that's not what he will do. He'll tell you that he's just fine. Maybe take a quick nap and fall asleep on top of a fish toad as quick as a snap. Then he'll wake up frozen from being so still and get all fired up about all the fish there is to kill. He'll roll through all the nets and tinker with them going through the motions just because he woke up from that nap feeling so damn frozen. Johnny knows there's not much tangled in the web of mesh, but he'll work them both just so nonetheless. He's given Bristol Bay 25 years and he's got 20 more, just like timeless other folks who fish those remote shores. He'll work beyond his time sifting the muddy sea. He is after all Iron Man, Fisherman Johnny B. Thank you. Oh, Max, what a wonderful tribute to your dad. That was great. Yeah, you know, I heard you read that last year, and I was sitting right next to your dad when, and it was so wonderful to watch his response. So, yeah, I've known your dad a long time, and I can say that sticking and staying, you know, that's that's been his way for a long, long time. We gillnetted together back in southeast Alaska in the early years before all you kids came on the scene. So it's really wonderful to to hear you being part of the whole fishing enterprise now and, and writing such a wonderful tribute. Thank you. So next up is my backup MC, Doug Rhodes from Craig, Alaska. And this is just a chance to thank Doug again. He's been such a great help. Okay, Doug, take it away. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Holly. Uh, my name is Doug Rhodes. I'm a gill netter and a long liner in uh, out of Craig here and uh, on Prince Wales Island. And I've watched uh, every performer so far this, uh, the last three days. And that's the first time we've ever been able to do that. And I've noticed something in watching all these performers. And the thing I've really noticed is that a lot of us kind of look the same. Uh, I think they call it the graying of the fleet. So it's kind of nice to see some of these young guys that are coming up and, uh, and young guys and gals that are doing the poetry and uh, are the future. And I like that, but it did remind me of a poem I wrote. I wrote it years ago and it's called Old Guys. I remember when I was just a kid and my eyes filled with surprise as I walked the docks and looked at boats and listened to the stories of the old guys. They talked about the good times and they talked about the bad times too, but I just sat there listening because it was all so exciting and new. I learned about thread and herring, splitting tails and twisting hooks, in and a banals at the diamond. You can't read this stuff in books. I heard about surviving tsunamis, how to keep spoons bright with hydrotone, advice on how to make and use a code sheet way back before anyone had a cell phone. And now, after almost 50 years of fishing, as I tell you this, I can finally realize that you're listening to every word I say crap i've become one of those old guys and you know sometimes you don't know if you're an old guy or not but uh i wrote this poem must have been 12 years ago and i had to change it to home after almost 40 years i had to change it to after almost 50 years so i guess that means you are an old guy and uh, my my last poem here this one has uh 
a little I, I have uh my my next performer here katrina peavy is going to be uh helping me with this one and this is a poem called the lima flag and it's a lighter look at a crappy year with the pandemic and everything but the lima flag uh lima is a code uh flag that represents the letter l in the alphabet and that letter l just happens to mean quarantine i don't know why q couldn't mean quarantine but apparently l got to mean uh that it was uh quarantine so this one is called lima flag this past year has really been nuts. It's one we sure don't want to repeat. COVID affected just about everything we do, and it really hit our fishing fleet. It seems that all the paperwork that was on my boat, I was constantly rearranging. Every week we got new state and federal mandates and all of the rules were changing. Now, I'm all about doing my part, and I know that all of this helped save lives. So we kept to our island social bubble and we learned about N95s. I even bought one of those fancy forehead thermometers. All of this stuff was becoming a drag. And in case we were exposed to Corona, we had to carry a Lima flag. Now, if you see the Lima flag flying, it should alert your fears. Because according to the International Code Signal book, it hasn't been used in 100 years. Only Alaska and Rhode Island adopted it, and most people don't know what it might mean. It's not that you're actually sick, it's just that your boat's in quarantine. So if you traveled to Alaska from out of state or had an active case of COVID-19, you had to fly your Lima flag for two weeks during your quarantine. One of our gill netters had his daughter fly up from Portland for his crew, and old Ralphie flew that Lima flag for everyone in the fleet to view. But after a while, we, flew, we uh, fell into a routine. And just like we had done at the start, we made sure to wear masks while in town and socially distance one fathom apart. Now, both my crew and I were locals, so this quarantine stuff seemed like a gag. I wasn't sure what it would take to have to fly that Lima flag. But looking back, I'm getting a little worried and on my conscience, it's starting to nag. Oh, I screwed up, didn't I? I helped a friend out with his hydraulics, and when they started to work, he let out a cheer. And just like always, when I came down to the boat, Brian had repaid me for some help with some beer. But looking back, I'm getting a little worried, and on my conscience, it's starting to nag, because he gave me a case of Corona. <laughs> so was I supposed to fly that Lima flag? Cheers to all you fisher poets out there, and I uh, can't wait to see you guys next year in Astoria uh, for real, in person. And up next, I have, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce a young fisher poet. Her name's Katrina, Katrina Peavy. She lives next door. I've known her since she was a baby. Uh, she comes from a fishing family. Everybody in her family fishes. Her sister, her brother, her dad, her mom, Grandma. or her grandma or grandpa or uncle, and uh, she's also a great writer. She spent the last 10 years in England, so you might notice she doesn't really have an Alaska accent. <laughs> so please welcome Katrina Peavy. Thanks, and cheers. Cheers. Yeah. I'll take that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me, um, and it's really good to be back. And just so everyone knows, uh, me and Doug have been vaccinated. And I also might add, I'm really happy to be in your kitchen and not the principal's office. So, <laughs> um, so last month during a community cleanup um, that I was participating in with Doug and Cheryl, um, I looked to my left and I saw an old, uh, an old family friend pull up. Uh, he was a passenger seat in a truck driven by his best friend, Von Skinney who was taking care of him during the last days of his life. And his name uh, is Rick Summers. His nickname is Too Tall. And so this poem is dedicated to him and it's called Short Hello, Long Goodbye. Fall beside the passenger into a fading midwinter day. Memories encompassing an old salt, peppered white and ashen gray. Light flickers, recognition revs, palms raise and 
lifelines extend. In the space between short words exchanged, a prickling pause nicked the side. Something else left unsaid. Something waited behind heavy eyes. 20 years had come to pass since tall eyes tied up next to mine and had I seen India's flag lowering half mast, what words might have bit that tagline? Tell us a tale of long ago, of a brother and two sisters racing along the groove dock. Carry us back to yesterday, back to childhoods long lost. Tell us about elemental ways of old, of favorite spoons and secret spots. Carry us back to yesterday, retie braided lessons before they snap off. Carve reminders of Babylonian bone to pluck strings of the speeding heart. Let us settle into its steady rhythm. Tell us of home before you depart. What was it like, the Alaska you loved, this great land steadily waning away? What was it like, the Alaska before? How can we protect this heart from pain? Remember another time on rock, before old growth was chipped and shorn, before salmon streams were mined for fool's gold, the balance severed from the norm? Or what if sequined moments waited upon Lady Justice's silver scales, lowering us beneath the surface, hooking wisdom to swell our sails? Let me pierce that prickling pause, release what belies the locked sigh, Turn past keys to unlock tomorrow, for our long goodbye is nigh. And before you follow the liquid gold road, towards the setting celestial sun, before you lift your hand one last time and bid farewell to loved ones, dip your pen in Chinook's ruby red, ribbons tying whispers to whistling wind. Tell us what the future holds, how merging currents ripple and spin. Let us fall beside your memory, a little longer into the quickening night, stars drifting from bracken skies to guide our vessel and set our course alight. Thank you very much. I hope everyone has a good fishing season. And if you stop in Myers Chuck, say hi to my grandparents, Steve and Cassie Peavy for me. Give them a, a well, a COVID safe hello. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Katrina and Doug. That was great. Love those visual aids. That was that was terrific. You guys are a good team. And boy, Katrina, that poem with that question, what was it like the Alaska before? I think I'm sure we all have wondered that and you captured it so beautifully. So thank you for those lovely poems. Next up, we have Alana Tensuka Samiento from Portland. And I hope I got close on your name a lot. I didn't get a chance to ask you the pronunciation, but feel free to correct me. And go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. You're going to give us some music, right? Yes. And that was a pretty good run, Holly. Um, yeah, Alana Kinsaku Sarmiento, um, six seasons in Bristol Bay, Black Lives Matter, Land Back, and uh, The Strengths of the Tides is hers also. Thank you, Elma. And thank you everybody who helped put this together this year. Needless to say, I miss you all as well. Um, I'm going to do a couple pieces, original pieces for you folks. If I could have my way, I'd be fishing every day, pass the time away upon the sea. Morning, noon, and night, I'd be finding my delight, casting out my net upon the water. Shimmering and green, every fisher person's dream Floats among the foam and rising waves Net the biggest prize, and with stars locked in our eyes Bring on home the money and the glory Still and ever clear, shallow waters draw us near We reach to break the surface of the sea Hands reach out to grasp, but the catch is much too fast, promising to live another season. 
Heavy, loud, and gray, unrelenting comes the day, trapped between our livelihood and home. No photos, phone, or mail could free or could avail, a longing for a lover's warm embrace. Windy, white, and blue, our hearts are holding true. The waters hold the promise of our dreams. Air and salt to meet on our faces as we greet the vast and ever changing great horizon. If I could have my way, I'd be fishing every day, pass the time away upon the sea. Morning, noon, and night, I'd be finding my delight, casting out my net upon the water. Thank you, and my next piece will be spoken. <clears throat> I think women are getting into the industry because hydraulics are making the job easier, he said. I thought, your daughter fishes. Is that really what you think? You don't think it had anything to do with the fact that we were told for centuries that our place was in the home where the laundry is laundered and the babies are born and the meals and the beds are made, that we were too fragile, too pure, too coveted, too weak to put ourselves out in the world with all its dangers. Much better that we weather the dangers of the home where all we have to fear are our partners and our depression rather than the sea with all its brute uncaring. Uncaring about what your strengths or weaknesses are. Uncaring that you have a family at home to feed, to return to. Uncaring about what's in your head or between your legs. Rather than the sea, where the growing presence of women might cause men to fear obsolescence more than drinking the deep. I thought, you're correct about the benefits of hydraulics, of all the technologies that allow us to work more efficiently with less effort. The technologies you race to employ. I wonder why all you have to say about the rising tide of feminine bodies and energies in the industry is to signal what you consider our weakness. I wonder why you don't have anything to say about what's gained. Is it because you don't see it? Because you don't want to see it? The way we use our brains to solve problems before we start lifting, the way we strategize, the finesse with which we lay our gear like sweeping arms, the vulnerability with which we communicate, the goddamn charm, the disarming, the care, the play, the resoluteness with which we approach the same filthy job. On the contrary, some of us have learned to imitate your emotions, to walk the same way, lift the same way, talk the same way, spit the same way, just so you can be made to feel more comfortable. Even the most macho among us is very likely employing all the testosterone in her body for the sake of coddling a man, which is, ironically, an insanely female thing to do. Keep the men comfortable. If you can't do that by staying in your assigned role, then you must assimilate, transform into something he can recognize so that he will not be confused or challenged. Do nothing to threaten his worth. I thought, you don't understand that your worth is highlighted when we work together, as is mine, that our differences complement each other that we can lift together, that I can lift alone, that we can cry together, that you can cry alone. Yet all you can say is that the only reason I'm doing your job is because a hose and some oil has opened the door wide for the weaker half. I thought it, but I didn't say it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alana. Powerful music, power, beautiful music and powerful words. Thank you for telling it like it is. And, and as Doug said earlier, I too am so grateful for all of these powerful young voices like the one that we just heard. Thank you. Next up is Josh Wisniewski from Sitka, Alaska. So Josh, if you're here, I'm here. Okay, good. Please say a few words about yourself. We'd love to hear from you. 
okay, I'm actually not from Sitka. I was living there in 2019 when I was trolling and came down, I, I guess, for Fisher Poets that year, but I'm back home in Seldovia now, and um, I have set net sites here, and I fish halibut here and jigs, so I'm a skiff fisherman, and uh, I'm going to read three poems. I'll try to do short and sweet. Uh, this first one's probably for Doug, since he likes old timers like me. All right. Uh, salty old timers don't bother with the cafe in the morning. They hold court at McDonald's. Oop, went full screen on myself. They hold court at McDonald's and keep the 30 year old conversation going. Well, this season was shit and management doesn't have a clue. And I've seen at the store, they've got organic beef selling for more than King salmon. That ain't right. And processors aren't paying enough, but there's only 26 fish delivered last period. And it's been spotty with lots of shakers too. Well, it's winter. I just tied up the boat and I'm out trapping Martin now. And I got four last week, but it's hard to call it winter because it's December and the mountains are still mostly snow free and forget about snowpack this year. Oh, when you guys hear about this blob 2.0, oh, for Christ's sake. Well, black cod's going gangbusters, but they're too small. And peacod crashed in the Gulf and they shut down federal waters. But they're getting some around Kodiak still. And somehow the halibut quota in 3A got a bump. But with all the small fish last year, it sure didn't see that one coming. Yeah, climate change is a fucking bitch. Finishing my number four sausage, egg, and cheese breakfast meal, I dip my head and quietly bow to these revered old masters. Don't worry, kid, they'll show up. The oil-stained bodhisattva wisdom of romantically optimistic grumpy bastards. Nodding, I get up and walk down to the boat. Uh, next one. Uh, I guess it's about myself. Getting off the ferry and shuffling through the crowds down south again on a work trip. And the forever outsider, the observer, always and everywhere. And that was before ethnography and grad school and debts and breakups. And looking around at all these other people walking off the ferry with clean clothes, khaki shorts and button down shirts and sandals and cool backpacks and water bottles, friends and families and cars and money. I know I'm not like that. And I'm not even been away a day and I'm already wondering if they're catching back home and flipping through the tide book. I think about where I'd set and I imagine the bottom and how the fish move around the rock piles in the current of a minus 0 0.07 tide, which will be tomorrow at 5.53 p.m. What's wrong with me? Did I just never learn how to grow up or to be a real adult with ambitions? I mean, all my clothes are stained in epoxy and fish blood and outboard oil and my wool jacket's torn and patched and my hat's the color of dirt and smells like chainsaw sweat and halibut. I'm more comfortable sleeping by the wood stove in my cabin than in a real house with water and couches and TV. It'd be better just to stay up north, keep living on dried kelp, smoked salmon and halibut and digging for butters and hunting octopus and collecting coal off the beach while studying the currents. At night, light from the stove and the banya flickering and dancing on rough spruce planks as bodies sweat together in hot steam. But maybe it's just like Nancy says, that's just my suchness, and maybe that's okay. So I'll let the emails and texts go unanswered and joyfully embrace the impoverished wealth of life of this place that's beyond the world of red dust, the place the Denina call where the spruce extends out. Um, and then my last one, this one's about halibut. Um, made a short set outside the mouth of the bay, off the island and lined up off the point. Two skates, just a hundred hooks, hand pulling. After 10 empty hooks, I feel your tug. You, the one who swims against the current, rises from 30 fathoms and looks up at me, slightly puzzled or perhaps angry. This guy? No one sets here. I get it too, because I'm just as surprised. I watch you just below the surface of the water and I feel a pang of sadness for the life I will extinguish. But don't get me wrong because I embrace my contradictions and I'd bow down and sell my soul to Mara for a thousand pounds of quota share and don't think that I wouldn't. I whisper a prayer, sink my gaff into your head and ask you to call in your brothers and sisters. Then legs braced against the side of the boat and waiting for the right swell, I sling you aboard. Shocked at this rapid change of circumstance, you fling yourself against wooden bin boards, but it doesn't help. 
You stare up at me as I slit your gills and your life force drains out in dark blood running across the decks. And I bow out of respect, thankful for the gift to one so undeserving. And I rip out your guts and watch as gulls feed on them. Okay, that's it. Wow, Josh, that was a powerful ending to that poem. I think we're all still in that image. You you brought it to us so beautifully. And I love the line in the earlier poem about the description of the old timers as diesel-stained bodhisattvas. Thanks for, for that wonderful reading. Next up, we have Gary Keister, who is actually a neighbor of mine I, in Port Hadlock. And I always love listening to Gary's stories and poems and, and so appreciate his good work in my community. So take it away, Gary. Well, thank you, Holly. And thanks to all of the people who put this together. I know it's been a, a difficult year and a real challenge to make such a wonderful production. Uh, I'm one of the older guys. I started uh, fishing as my grandfather's cabin boy when I was eight years old and uh, I've never lost the love of the sea. And so these poems are taken from years of, of sailing primarily. So the first one is Salmon Saner. Flood tides pulling strong and hard, nets heavy. Early gold sun shadows glisten off scraggly Sitka Cypress. Crew up before dawn, defying bone chilling glacier winds blowing through layers of wool and rubber. The icy black sea displays no trace of life as crewmen pull ferociously on strained hemp lines, the saner heaving and groaning. The crew tugs at the web as it rolls over the steely paretic power block, swinging precariously from atop the boom. The tall, lanky kid balances gracefully on the edge of the turntable, meticulously stacking Spanish courts in perfect symmetrical rows. Out 50 fathoms, a sockeye jumps along the cork line as dozens fin in the sane's heart. The quicken of the motions build and a silvery salmon emerges killed in a mesh. Then another and another tension mounts. As the bunt end is dragged aboard, all hands rush to the bulwarks. There are thousands, a silver horde of the finest blood red sockeye. Are you hearing me? Yep, you sound great, Gary. Okay. Uh, the second poem is uh, Grand Back Then. It was grand back then, those post-war 40s, where life was steady in that closely knit island fishing village. Still today, it's comforting to return traveling through rich soil Skagit Valley crossing the Swimmer Slough and driving down the avenue called Commercial, where the air is fresh and the sea salt scent all consuming. Oh, the familiar smells of childhood long gone, save my well of memories. I wander the tired, abandoned, weather-beaten cannery. It's wet red paint faded a dull blush after decades of battering by harsh salt and wind-driven seas, vividly I see and smell the fresh sockeye being unloaded at the cannery dock as tons of seawater bathe their sleek blue-back bodies. Conveyed to worn wooden bins, tall and tawny young men in tattered yellow rain gear shovel crystal clear ice over the precious cargo. In the dimly lit fish house, the stink of blood and guts, where the glorious creatures are butchered and sliced, while old bent women in black and blue kerchiefs hand pack the blood red meat into half pound cans. 
The clinky tins moved noisily towards the click, click, click of the relentless steel gray seamers, then stacked aboard rusty metal pallets and shoved in asbestos coated tomb like chambers. The cookers discharged a shrill sounding, scalding, sizzling steam. Penetrating the high pile tins, cooking the hearty flesh, yet preserving its appreciated crimson color, and the village smells delicious. My last poem is called The Ebb. He visited the rock on the stormy, stony shoreline as long as he could remember. It never appeared to change. Yet it did, little by little as each ebb and flood, as harsh seas whittled out the perfect pew for a boy and a granddad. Now he gazes solo, regarding the curling white water whispering beneath his black hip boots, recalling how the sea had fashioned him, sailing with the old man from Puget Sound to the Gulf and out west to the unrelenting Bering Sea. Now the water flows deliberately away as life ebbs one particle at a time, evoking life's marvels and the significance of the coarse grain granite hosting the tiniest bits of life that encrusts body and soul. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Boy, another powerful reading and, and your descriptions are just so vivid. You just brought me back to my first summer in Alaska working in the Petersburg cannery with that, that description. So thank you again. And that last poem especially was really stunning. Okay, next up, we've got Brad Warren from Seattle. And um, most of you may know Brad is also the director of Global Ocean Health. And I hope some of you were able to attend his session this afternoon. They're doing great work trying to um, preserve the fisheries in the face of all the challenges that we're facing. So can't wait to hear from you, Brad. What have you got for us? I've got a piece called The Great Fisher Poets Brawl. I had some fun on this one. And I had some uh, real fun with a co-writer, uh, Jeff Cars, who's been here a number of times, too. Um, so uh, I'll just plunge in and uh, with apologies to all concerned. Um, Free Willie drained his stout and took the mic and stared at the crowd. Call yourselves Fisher Poets. Well, I'll be picking you clowns from my teeth. Gonna read or just duck behind your beer like a snapper in a reef. Well, that's enough, squirt. Mind your place in the food chain, growled Big Pat. You can't eat the Fisher Poets. They're the reason we all came. Clem Stark raised a hand in the air. The room fell to a watchful hush. Clem took the stage like a rattler takes his lair. Might be just a trick of light, but some folks claim they saw lightning in his hair. The old builder of poems planted himself in front of Free Willie. With a crafty smile, no one could read. One part kindness, one part switchblade that he spun to face the crowd. Fisher poets, now's your time, don't be a tease. No pushing, no shoving, no biting, no spitting, please. Mo Bow Stern was first to rise. She looked Willie up and down. What makes you so free? You flying low. Or is that just the breeze fluttering your britches? They say, hey, how come those britches are so frilly? You ain't dropped a load in your pants yet. Well, you will, Mr. Willie. 
Well, that's when the melee busted out through the smashed up chairs and the fists and shouts. The flying lance sailed the room and it yanked Mobile Stern off the stage. And a tall cowboy, more mustache than face, leapt up to the mic and man, he looked and raged. I can't let a woman show me up. I'm the best there ever was. Nah, you're just a harpoon. Big Pat hurled him clear through the saloon. And even now, the great Fisher poets say they can still see his boots sticking out the glass. If you get lost, just look for the long line of Astoria cowgirls waiting to kick his ass. Well, Free Willy took in the sea of shouts and fists, and he just could not resist. Y'all got some fine words that don't hang a broom in the rigging. You were just in a bull sea lion barreled in, and it pilled, pinned Free Willy to the floor. You smell good, you my favorite little Harry. And that big tusk bull was in the boot. A flash of black and white broke the spell. Big as a rail car. The killer whale came for food. Gnashing teeth like a row of spear points. You got sea lions in this joint. Let me add them. That's my only wish. Why let a tasty pinniped steal your fish? Well, the Stella slunk out the back, and a guy named Broderick finally stood. He stepped up to the pearly rack. He said, I just got a few words, so listen good. Thanks for clearing out the riffraff. Now, I need you to watch the door. You can have the sea lions, but don't eat the fisher poets. But they're the reason why we're here. Don't eat the fisher poets. They're the reason why we're here. Oh, Brad, that was terrific. <laughs> Thank you. I, I hope I don't regret it too bad, but uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the chance to be here. Thanks for pulling us all together. <laughs> you bet. Well, thank you for um, just reminding us of what what a great family we have. I loved hearing about Clem, especially since he can't be here tonight, and Mo and Ron and all the Fisher Poet family. So thanks again, Brad. Okay, next up, we've got Megan Gervais from Homer. And Megan, if I didn't pronounce your name correctly, please correct it. Um, you were pretty close, Megan Gervais. And I have Ruby and Mazzy here with me. Right. My kids, um, really the biggest joy of my life is being able to fish with my kids. And um, our set tonight is focused around that. So first thing is um, just something I threw together today, feeling a little intimidated to talk in front of you all. This is Courage Poem. If I can point the bow out the channel and beat into the waves stacked up steep and close by 25 knot west wind against ebb, then throw one out in the breakers, green water crumpling over the stern as we haul a heavy net. If I can do these things, then I can stand here in front of you and speak these words. Ruby, are you ready for yours? Come back. Ruby's gonna read one. One of the best things about fishing with kids is that they help, they start to help with stuff. And now I've got this kid that can help me, help me read. So this was a collaborative poem that we wrote together and Ruby's gonna read it. You ready? Wanna start together? Okay, this is called Boat Kids. Out, out on, on deck, deck, every deck. set they're ready. Head on, gloves on, boots on, working steady. Picking fish, getting splashed, and it's blowing west 20. They don't care because they want their money. Hold the flashlight, run for tools, run the hydro sometimes. Tie it up, let it go. 
need a gradual life. But your nine-year-old outwork grown men, they'll show you how it's done and be in bed by 10. One kid on corks and one on leads. They'll make it look easy because it is, they said. <laughs> Sriracha on their carrots. Legos out. Work done. Swimming every day at sunset. Having fun. That was awesome. Way to go, Ruby. Um, I loved listening to Alana um, read her last poem. Really hit home. Um, Alana's an incredible fisherman and an amazing person. I fished with her for a couple of years and she knows how to get it done better than most men I've ever fished with. Um, I, it just made me like reminisce about, there was this night in the Nushigak, now known as the night when um, there were so many fish and boats sank and the nets were so heavy. Anyway, we hauled our net and went to deliver and the crew was just so worked. And Alana, like I could barely stand up and we were delivering, like she just pretty much did the whole delivery. And um, it was just wretched weather and so many fish. And <laughs> um, we pull away from the tender and like, the, it was just, she and I delivered because the other guys were just done. And she's like, okay, we're going to go make another set. And sure enough, we did. We, we set it out and drifted out the channel, like out into the dark and loaded up again. So thanks for that, Alana. Um, that was a total little sidebar that I was not planning on doing, but I couldn't help it. Okay. We've got one more quick one about kids. This is about my son who also fishes with me. He's not here. Okay, turning point. Grumbling, mumbling teenager won't wash dishes, won't wash down, scowls at the waves and swears under his breath and above it. Puts on heavy metal and wishes for a cell signal. Mom is such an asshole. This stupid boat, this stupid ocean. Then that night on the South Line, blowing West 20 and the Hynotic sender came off in my hand as we left the tender in a shower of glycol on a big ripping ebb, full throttle and unable to shift. How we got the anchor down safely, I still can't remember, but it wasn't the full share guy, racked out and oblivious. It was the teenager who got it done. So, um, last of all, we have a little ukulele song. I'm fairly novice at the ukulele, but this year as um, a strategy to combat a little anxiety that I get before openers when it's really busy and crowded and there's lots of boats and I'm looking for a place to put my net, I've started strumming the ukulele. And sometimes these people sing along with me. This is a very short song. Sing it. You should get saga, show me the way. You should get saga, got something to say. Look you in the eye, fish don't lie. You should get saga, voodoo, 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 you're the best fish that ever lay a day. Sometimes one, sometimes two, sometimes enough for the whole crew. You should get psyched, show me the way. You should get psyched, I got something to say. Look you in the eye, fish don't lie. You should get psyched, voodoo, voodoo, All right, that's all we got. Thanks everybody. Oh, thank you, Megan. And thank you to Ruby, your whole family. That was just a terrific collaboration. Oh, I just love that and love the ukulele too. So, so glad you were able to join us. I'm, I'm really wonderful. I look forward to seeing you in person next time. Okay, next up we have Joel Miller from Portland and, um, Joel has a song for us as well, I believe. Yes, I do. Uh, gosh, thanks everybody that's gone before me. 
um, everybody that's put this together. Um, I, uh, I started fishing in 1992 and um, fished for several years up in Kodiak. And this song is about fishing on the Shelikoff in the winter. Um, and uh, somehow John Broderick found me in mid 2000s in, in Portland and uh, got me involved in this. And I thought I had lost my connection, but uh, I've been uh, reunited with a lot of people I know and met amazing people along the way. So thank you all for uh, what you do. And uh, this song's called Shelikoff. <laughs> ancient ocean praying I endure praying I endure and I watch the oak come down defeated light all that's exposed is taken by the tide the highs and lows of an end in my life. I want to be with you. And when black and green don't lie, flash of gold and green. Framed against this restless vessel is haunting as a dream. And I can hear the sirens call over wind and wind. Hold steady course my captain the rocks on shore oh the rocks are sure and i watch the elk come down defeated light all that's exposed is taken by the tide the highs and lows of loving in my life. You look at me with no sky. The albatross is framed against 
this farming ocean the good luck for oh, the good luck And I watch the elk come down defeated life. All that's exposed is taken by the tide. The highs and lows of loving in my life. I look at you with love. I look at you with love. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Sorry, my dog is barking in the background and I can't do anything about it. So I think she's just clapping for you. Um, let's see. Next up, we've got Toby Sullivan. And Toby has been a longtime Fisher poet. He hails from Kodiak, Alaska. And you've got a good, um, a powerful reading in store for you. Welcome, Toby. Hi, Holly. And a big shout out to Joel. I knew Joel when he first started fishing in Gannic Bay about a million years ago. So that's good. And a big 100,000 kudo thank yous to the tech team that made this possible. I was a little skeptical a few months ago, but it's going fabulously. And I think I'm pretty impressed. So here goes. This is a kind of a send off letter to someone that's heading out to the Bering Sea. It's called The Things You Need. You need Goodyear extra tough boots, two pairs for when the ankles get holes from being folded down to dry, two sets of orange Grunin's rain gear, jacket and pants. Dutch Harbor gear is okay too. They even have pockets now, but the hoods on the Heli Hansen jackets are too small for some guys and the dark green color is invisible at night in the water if you go over, if anything happens. Nothing from West Marine will last one good day. And if it looks like something you'd wear in a sailboat, forget about it. Even on the reinforced Grundens, the knees will go out in a few weeks, climbing into the pots, climbing up on the stack, hefting 100 pound coils of line into the pot with your knee. The crabs will grab the cuffs, the sleeves will catch on the corners of pots. The picking hook will tear the sleeve off the shoulder and it will happen a minute after you walk out on deck in a brand new jacket, the smell of orange plastic fresh in the wind, the $70 price tag still flapping on the collar as you tear it off in disgust. You need neoprene wristers like the sleeves of a diver's dry suit, at least two pairs so there's always warm ones in the dryer, a couple dozen cotton glove liners, a case of green neoprene gloves, $100 a dozen, with the long cuffs that go up under the sleeves of your rain jacket. So the water runs down your arm and off your fingers. You need them because the dryer will make them brittle because thousands of spiny opie crab shells will scuff the rubber off the fingertips because a hundred miles of line will come out of the crab block every day and abrade the notch between the right thumb and index finger like a fast river cutting through soft rock because at the end of the day, at the end of the trip, half the lefts will still be under the, will still be in the drawer under your bunk and all the rights will be trashed in a box in the entryway. And you will pick through them every morning looking for the ones with the smallest holes. You need a wool stocking cap, though it will get wet and freeze and weigh so much your neck will hurt. The military tank helmet liner with the little strap that snaps under your chin for your ears in February working up against the ice pack in the Pribilovs. The neoprene face mask for when it gets really cold, when the ice fog starts moving across the water in those spooky little wisps. An insulated Mustang suit for working on top of the crab pot stack in the wind, for chopping ice off the rails, 
for setting the anchor at two in the morning behind St. Paul when it's blowing 50. Make sure it's the kind with the inflatable collar that has a mouth tube to blow it up that will keep your head out of the water if anything happens. And a CO2 cartridge that goes off automatically, hopefully, if you are unconscious, if anything happens. You need lots of hats, build caps with the logos of bars and canneries and equipment companies. Sometimes hats are lucky, but you will not keep them. They will blow off in the wind when you look up at Coast Guard C-130s going over, get ground up in the bait chopper by your friends for a joke, dropped between the dock and the boat while drunk, taken by girlfriends for souvenirs, lost. You need a pair of uptown jeans for the elbow room, a set of Carhartts for doing gear work in town. Thick polypropylene socks, all of one pattern, so, your knee, so you know where whose are whose when they come out of the dryer. Felt boot liners, those little blue booty inserts, sweatpants and hooded sweatshirts, enough to always have a dry set to put on. Lots of cotton t-shirts for changing out of between the strings of gear when you soak them through with your sweat. Underwear. You need a knowledge of cookery, the ability to know how to change the oil in a Caterpillar 3298, an appreciation for dawn, a respect for night. Books about anything, money, your toothbrush, extra strength Tylenol, knee pads, a Walkman, Jimi Hendrix for good days and Hank Williams for bad ones, paper for letters, stamps to mail them, a calling card for the phone on the dock in Akutan, the numbers of people who will answer that phone late at night, who will listen to you breathe when you forget what you wanted to say, who will know without being told. Pictures of those people, a calendar, the memory of dry land, summer, trees, and the smell of your woman, a piece of her clothing in case you forget, your plans for the future, and a plane ticket home. Thank you, and I'll see you all in Nestoria next year. Thank you, Toby. What a great list. Boy, that, I, the line about the wristers, oh, <laughs> that's so great. They're never together. So um, wonderful. That reminds me a little bit of a poem that Smitty used to read. Um, yeah, it was just nice to think about all those, all the things we need, and then all the intangible things too. Thank you. Next up, we have, let's see, Katrina Porteus coming all the way from Northumberland, England. And this is one of the advantages. We, we, we know we're missing seeing each other in person, but we're really glad that Katrina is able to join us tonight. Welcome, Katrina. And it's really, Thanks. it's early in the morning where you are, right? What time is it? It's uh, 20 past five. So thanks, Holly, and thanks to everyone who's put this together. This is just amazing to be part of it and such an honor to join you. Thank you. Um, here's, a, here's a picture I took this morning of, of uh, the village where I live, the harbor here. So just you get, get an idea of it. There's, there's not very much fishing left here now, but uh, I spent many years in the, really steeped in the fishing and on the boats and um, trying to record what I could of the, of the life here. So I'm gonna be reading some poems about that tonight. It was incredible. It's been incredible tonight to hear so many strong women fishers talking about their, their lives. Um, it's almost unheard of here for women to, to, to fish for a living. Although I went on the boats, I didn't fish for a living because women, women just didn't in my generation and, and still don't. But it's, it's, it's really good to hear that, uh, to hear of, of, of women fishers in, in the States. Um, I'm gonna start though with an excerpt from a poem about what the women did do because they were very strong here and the boats could not have gone to sea without them in the old days before my time when we had the long line fishing here. So this is just a little excerpt about those women. In the dark of the morn were pokes and sacks, bent to the mushels, creels, cotton were backs, heft them here to the crack at the skein, fingers fleeing like a sharp machine, dabs and sprags and git muggle haddocks for the two who are groomed. 
Kips for the square to the steed and benty. 1400s may that plenty. Van I slavery. Half a family cannot make a better of it. Jiggered at 40. So um, the fishing villages here, the women had their role and the men had their role. And the men went off to sea and the women stayed at home. And that was just how it was done. Um, but the women were baiting the long lines and they had their own culture and their own community uh, uh, here on land. And they helped launch the boats because the, the men didn't want to go to sea wet. So the women would be pushing the boats down the beach and all of that. And uh, I'm going to just read a very short poem now about um, a bird on the shore here called the eider duck. And the eider duck always makes me think about those women because um, the eider ducks, the, the, the male ducks go off to sea all together and the female ducks create this kind of community where they all communally look after the ducklings. So you get about half a dozen eider ducks and all these little ducklings, about 30 of them all together. And we call these, these ducks cubby ducks or cuddy ducks because they were supposed to be um, St Cuthbert's favourite duck and St Cuthbert uh, lived just, just off uh, on an island just off, off the coast here. So this is cubby. Cubby, you're a bonny board, mild and our soft, waller and doon the oozy a sea feet, brune as an hard dopper. Are you no feared, rowling about the lippers or among folks? That much at him about the weirds, you've disappeared. Your heeds are watch, your nebs are fed, ye snook and plodge among the bents, a heap of barky gear, biding quiet. Where's your man? Awa. Ah, but in me. Dadden like corky duckers, thought he strong, and ah, the bonny bairns, thrustle doing soft and sooty, ah, together, everybody's business. You're a hell village. So I'm going to finish um, with a poem about my old mentor and friend, Charlie Douglas. Can you, can you see him there? That's Charlie. Um, and this poem is called The Marks to Gambai. I asked Charlie what a fisherman must know. Ah, bloody things, he answered me. How so? A fisherman had to have brains in our one time. His fingers twisted round the slippery twine in the stove's faint firelight. It was getting dark. Them days, he said, we had to gun by marks. Stag at the fair and hoose, Hebron beetling trees. Thus he began the ancient litany of names, half vanished, beautiful to hear. Gun ruined the point, keep Bamber Castle clear, the black rock mind. Of Newton, steer until he have staggered level the nick of the broad mill. Novice, I listened. In the gloom, I saw the rolled up sail by the long unopened door, a traveller stiff with rust, a wood wormed mast, all the accumulation of the ancient past. Now keep the church on Alexander Hoos and Yon's road. Oh, Charlie, what's the use? I said. These memories, I know they're true and certainly they're beautiful. But how can you compete with all the science of these modern days? The echo sound has finished your outdated ways. Efficiency, that's what they want, not law. Why should the past concern us anymore? I couldn't see his face. The stove had died. There's Nain Crab's new, said Charlie sadly, and he sighed and seeming not to hear me, sealed the knot. When you see lippers coming, when to stop and when to gan, that's what you need to know. The sea's the boss. Me father told me so. Them marks, he said. He handed ah them doon like right and wrong. Them beggars for the tunes. He sliced the twine he sewed with savagely. The devil now what's right? The gan to see their only minds for profit. They'll no give name thought to who their sons will have to live. I saw then, so I said, as we embark, the past is map and measure, certain mark to steer by in the cold, uncertain sea. We leave it like the land, but all we know, what to hang on to and when to let go, leads from it. Aye, said Charlie, sick and so. Thank you and have a great fishing season. Thank you, everyone. Oh, thank you, Katrina. Wonderful to hear about fishing life in your village, in your town and in England and the ways in which it's so similar and the ways in which it's different too. I, I really love those pieces. I love learning about the eider ducks too. And that last line, what to, what to hang on to and what to let go. Those are resonant words. 
now we're able to slip in um, an extra musician, and not just an extra musician, actually, but Mary Garvey, who I always think think of has the voice of an angel. So please welcome Mary Garvey. Thank you so much. I'll go fast. Um, I'll sing Do You Need Another Hand? It's based on a book called Salmon Fever by Lisa Pinner. And I'm not a fisher myself, but I've worked in various support roles, to make a long story short. 300, maybe 50 more were lost this year upon our shore, but still they come to our back door. Do you need another hand? With cap in hand and eyes that plead, Mister, I've ten mouths to feed, and they are grateful, yes, indeed. Do you need another hand? Some are Serb and Russian Finn, they leave no wives or next of kin. The sea will wash the next crew in, do you need another hand? They're ordered not to go that far, to stay on the side of the bar. But they'll go where the salmon are, do you need another hand? They'll follow after fish and gull as long as there are nets to pull. And sometimes they are over full. Do you need another hand? They're buried where the waves won't reach on rocky hill or sandy beach with two to dig and none to preach. Do you need another hand? I dream at night while in my sleep of naked men lost in the deep. Their cries would make the angels weep. Do you need another hand? That's about the Astoria area bar. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, and thank you, Mary. What a wonderful taste. And just thank you so much for all of your sort of work as a historian in the area and the way you bring it alive in song. So I'm really glad we could we could slip you in. And um, it's been really fun reading the chat. And I think, Katrina, there's consensus here that we need to find a way to bring you back in person next year. So um, we're talking GoFundMe sites even. Um, gosh, and I'm the last one. I get to wrap up. It's an honor to do that. Um, since I left fishing in the late 80s, Fisher Poets has really become my connection to the life I, I loved in Alaska. And over the past couple decades since Fisher Poets started, it's been really wonderful to hear more voices, especially some of the ones we heard tonight. I'm especially grateful for the strong voices of my sister Fisher Poets and even more grateful knowing that this isn't true in other parts of the world. I think in these more ever more challenging times, we need all our voices. I'm gonna read two poems. One is very old and one is pretty new. Um, just a little bit of quick background. I, Dave at Hartwick and I fished the Merry Maid in Southeast Alaska for four years. And then we ran tenders for four years in Prince William Sound, Togiak, and Bristol Bay. Um, so I'm gonna, I, I did leave gill netting. It was hard for me to, to kill a creature as beautiful as a salmon. And I used to read this poem at some of the earliest Fisher poets, and I thought it might be time to read it again. I've been thinking a lot about salmon lately as um, they are under pressure now from diminishing runs, under pressure from mining and logging, and of course, all the complexities of a warming ocean. Um, so this is this is ablution, and it takes place on the um, deck of a trawler. I went out with a friend, um, and this was written after after cleaning fifty beautiful king salmon in Frederick Sound on a, a sunny afternoon. Ablution from the trolling cockpit. I wish watched. You rise like a prayer to the surface, pull you from the sea, slide the hook from your jaw, your silver body in my hands, gasping in the shock of air. I lay the bowing arc of you on the plywood table to be cleaned. The cannery says I must bleed you while you're still alive. 
I slice an artery and your blood pools thick and red on deck. Slit your long white belly. Pull out your luminous organs heavy with herring. Stroke your scales. Ask forgiveness. Sluice your belly with seawater until your bones glisten white and startled against pink flesh. And the water runs red, but your body knows still what to do, how to move in the bright water. Down I lay you on the wet deck, empty and shining, and the wing of your tail strokes the wood as you swim away into air, a silver river of memory, longing for the sea. I haven't read that in a long time. And it's funny how just reading it brings that day back so vividly. And I think that's that's really the power of, of poetry and music. And that's why we do this. So my second poem is from a, my most recent collection, Hold Fast, which came out in February, almost a little over a year ago today, right before the pandemic. And um, I think you might recognize a few of the images that were inspired by my fishing days. It's called Credo. Make a place for the glint in the seal's eye that second before he rolls back his slick head, slips silent beneath the surface. Make room for the shimmer of salmon, splitting the sun, leaping for the stream of her birth, even knowing what's ahead. Carve out a corner for the crab who grasped the blade of the cleaver that sliced him in two wouldn't let go. That light, dazzling dark sea ahead, remember it. Remember how it seeps from billowing cumulus when you least expect, or how the sun finds the crack in the horizon solder to empty out its cargo at dusk, a slick sheen across the water. How the green spinning earth and the blue brimming sea go on and on, even when we're not looking. And that perhaps if we can pay attention for even a second, remember just this, it may not make us whole, but it could be a good place to begin. And I wanted to say before I read this poem that really one of the great gifts of my fishing years were that I think they really taught me to pay attention, that we had to pay attention. You never knew what the weather was going to give you. And that it's really a, a habit of mind that I'm really grateful for um, many years later. So thank you. And I have the pleasure of wrapping up and I think we're almost on schedule just a few minutes over thanks to everybody for hanging in there with us thanks to all of you who are still there so let's just have a hand for the performers um this evening both first set and second set just I know you're out there clapping with me Good, good. It's great to hear you. And thanks to everyone for joining us, whether it's just this set or the whole weekend. We sure hope that you can, we'll be able to see you in person next year in Astoria. But before we end, I'd like to have a final shout out to Amanda and her crew. She's been like the Wizard of Oz back there behind the screen doing all the work. So Amanda, we want you to come out and take a bow. Um, <laughs> Please, there you go. So kudos, big hand for Amanda. Thank you guys. It was just an amazing honor to be part of this. Such beautiful performances all three nights. Thank you so much. Yes, and thanks to your crew too, Jamie Doyle and Megan Kleibach. So you guys are terrific. We couldn't have done this without you. So. Thank you again. And um, thanks to everybody. I'm going to turn it over to John Broderick for the final word. Hi, Holly. If well, John. yes, thank you, Holly. Thanks, Hi. Amanda and Jamie and everybody. Doreen's with us. We have felt like we've been with everybody, as I'm sure you all have. I I, I hope you don't mind. I had a little poem that uh, I maybe would read just now because it reminds me of how I feel now. I wrote it when uh, my boy Henry, who's a veteran fisherman now, when he made his first trip out there, 
oh, I don't know, he was 10 or 12 years old. It's called How to Tell a Good One. It goes like this. The new kid wears waders that come clear to his chin and a life jacket at his mother's wise insistence. When at the end of a long slog across the mud, we reached the skiff, Pete, his brother, a veteran of a dozen campaigns, hauls him aboard by the scruff of his gear. But the kid coils the line as Pete pulls the anchor. Nobody has to tell him. And as we set for the first time this season, he neatly throws clear a loop of lead line from a bin board snag. He pulls when we pull. He picks when we pick making surprisingly quick work of your basic number one double gill on the bag side, he hardly touches the fish. And when we break at the water's edge, he's quick to the beach with a dip net, rounding up stragglers, and climbs back into the boat three times. Practicing, he said. At the bottom of the tide, we cut the skiff loose. Pete carves a tight turn at the outside buoy. The skiff Pulls up easy along slide, alongside. I snag the trip line, tie it astern. Pete toes out and up until we like what we see and nod both. He cuts the throttle. I cast the buoy free. The boat drifts a moment in the lazy brown current and the blue two-stroke exhaust. In the bow, the new guy is watching. He hikes up his bibs, hooks his thumbs in his suspenders. What we just do, he wants to know, and that's what I feel like tonight. I feel like what what we just do. Uh, I want to know. We just had a great weekend. Doreen and I spent three days in our living room with all of you, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we we don't know what happened, but it was great, and we had no idea it was going to be so great. Thanks to everybody who made it a great weekend. Uh, there's more good things that happen. When did we ever get to see uh, everybody? And that's just a, a wonderful thing. And of course, uh, Amanda, we are uh, so grateful for you uh, making this happen with us. So, thank you. We'll see you. Uh, we'll see you next year in Astoria. We hope. Jay, what do you want to tell us? Just thanks for coming and. Uh... We're placeholders here. I think we're just going to keep this thing going. And it's really been great. Uh, hard to uh, see everybody go again. I mean, I guess we'll be a while before we see you all, but we'll be here and we'll try and keep the fire burning. So it's been great. And uh, we'll be thinking about next year already. All right, all. Well, thanks. Keep riding. Keep fishing. Be safe. We'll see you a little later. God bless you all. Adios. <laughs>